good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, and to uh, go on with the next lec uh, lecture. I was very happy that uh, Matt Bagot pointed to the origin of LSD. Uh, to remember me, it comes from Basel indeed. So we had studied LSD since the 50s at our institute, so we are quite uh, familiar with this kind of drugs. And uh, we brought in the neuroscience in the 90s as I joined the institute. But 10 years ago, there was a tremendous study comparing all different kind of drugs with uh, others in uses of all the states, for instance, like sensory deprivation or sensory overload. And this motivated us to look with newer tools like neuroimaging or brain mapping on these uh, dimensions of altered states because Dietrich and his co-worker Donny Lamparter and uh, Maurer had uh, suggested that all the states can be defined by five uh, independent uh, dimensions. We will see that somewhat later. So what we have done since uh, 1990 is we have studied almost about 1,200 subjects under controlled uh, placebo-controlled conditions on the various drugs, uh, MDMA, uh, ketamines, amphetamines, and some under uh, psilocybin. We mostly use the psychophysiological methods and psychometrics, and um, more recently, neuroimaging, PET, EEG, and uh, fMRI. So what are the topics we follow since these years? Uh, one of the first topics I want to go in is phenomenology of uh, dimensions, uh, altered states. I want to go into the basic dimensions. Then later on, I go into the neural correlates of uh, altered states. So these uh, dimensions that Dietrich had proposed based on a comparison of about uh, five different inducers like uh, meditation, relaxation techniques or drugs versus some other tongue, concentric deprivation, uh, came out as a construct. He said there might be one dimension called oceanic boundlessness, which reflects more the positive uh, experience with psychedelics in terms of uh, mood enhancing effects and loss of ego boundaries experienced in a positive way up to a mystical experience. There's a kind of opposite pole, which uh, they label the uh, anxious ego dissolution, which also compri compromises uh, thought with other paranoid reactions, and so on, which is much more similar to a classic psychotic reactions. And an interesting dimension was um, visual effects, which they summarized under visionary reconstructualization. So. This uh, dimension is more complex. It also um, includes uh, facilitating of uh, repressed memory and uh, release of autobi autobiographic uh, memory traces. So we had the idea on the first step uh, to go somewhat deeper into this uh, construct uh, after we had done uh, more than 20 years of uh, research using the scale and a number of others and we wanted to re-evaluate these dimensions because uh, we wanted to know aren't there some other dimensions that may be uh, in this larger concept. So what came out uh, as we have done recently a meta-analysis of uh, our findings. We've, um, Analyzing this uh, mathematical uh, approach, uh, about 500 subjects under three conditions. Some had had uh, the drug several times uh, versus placebo. And we found uh, about 11 sub dimensions that we can now quite validly measure with a kind of psychometric tools, we, so classical rating scales. But uh, so we had much more insight in the dimension like oceanic boundlessness, which we split down to noetic consciousness, deeply felt positive mood, feeling of unity, 
then also feelings of uh, melting with the environment and also the experience of that. On the other hand, we also could split down somewhat the visual effects and uh, the anxious ego dissolution, which basically is loss of control, loss of uh, control o over cognition and body, and anxiety, which uh, reflect more the psychotic reactions. So, using these newer scales, these 11 uh, scales, we could better then go on and measure um, the psychological alterations in altered states, like here, for instance, with MDMA or ketamine or psilocybin, you see on the left side such a kind of spider web where we gave different doses and you can see that the alterations on the subdimensions depends on a dose. Uh, for instance, red is a low dose, a medium dose, blue is the highest dose in this uh, set of data. On the right side you have quite a different configuration. It is uh, the effect of ketamine different doses. And just as a comparison, for instance, MDMA uh, gives you just a complete different picture with uh, um, emphasis on emotional aspects like being in a blissful state and so on, but almost no effect on the visual uh, scales like elementary or complex hallucinations. Okay. So what the another question was from a psychological point of view is, can we predict altered states? And we had already from a study from Dietrich a lot of information that uh, some predictors may be around, like uh, the most uh, uh, important one he had put forward was uh, emotional liability. If a subject fe uh, can be measured with a number scale and we can demonstrate, that they are emotionally stable, that contributes to a positive uh, ego uh, dissolution or loss of uh, ego boundaries. I don't want to go in all these details, it's all published, but what I want to put forward was that we found in, in, in a much larger data set with about 1,000 subjects and almost 2,000 trials, that uh, the dose is still the most impressive uh, predictor that uh, if you put all in a more complex uh, multivariate analysis, first pops up the dose and then uh, emotional stability, then for instance uh, optimistic extroversion is very important and non-dogmatic -dog uh, re religiosity. So very uh, interesting uh, psychological aspects that can contribute to this positive experience. It's much harder to predict uh, anxious ego dissolution where people get paranoid, but mostly it was rigid conventionality and uh, instability in an emotional sense. Now we have uh, more evidence uh, based on our data that also genetic aspects can influence uh, the reaction, particular to serotonergic hallucinogens, we found one polymorphism in the 2A receptor, which you will see has an uh, impact on these reactions. Whoops. Okay, now I want to focus today a little bit more on uh, the biological aspects, how we try to approach these states uh, based on neuroscience uh, based concepts. And one of the concepts is sensory gating, which goes back to the animal research in the 80s that uh, people had said that the kind of sensory overload you can experience in psychedelic state may be due to an impairment of a filter that always filters and gates the sensory stimuli that come into the brain. So. How can we measure this? We can measure uh, such a uh, filter me uh, mechanism in animals as well as in humans by measuring the startle uh, induced, acoustic induced startle response, for instance, by measuring the eye blink and the effect on the eye muscles, or in animals by the whole body uh, startling effect. So when you give a loud, intensive pulse to the ears, then subject immediately 
immediately startle with an eye blink. They have a kind of amplitude you can measure physically. And if you give a, a very uh, short pre-pass before with a low intensity, then the startling uh, pulse is reduced and the reduction is uh, a measure of the capacity to gate such loud stimuli in case of acoustic stimuli. And we can use that as a very basic uh, psychophysiological measure to approach uh, the effect uh, that uh, psychedelic may have on this startling response. What you see here is, in fact, uh, that subject under placebo have a certain capacity to react to this startling pulse. And if we give uh, psilocybin, we found a reduction in some uh, parameters that uh, are linked to very short pre-pulse pulse, pulse uh, ISIs that go before a, the startle stimulus, and you saw a reduction in this filter capacity. Interestingly is that this effect was uh, linked to the 2A receptor, which we had thought since years that the 2A receptor is very important in uh, gating and in the basic effects of the psychedelics. We think that the 2A receptor is the primary uh, receptor where these uh, 2A hallucinogens uh, dock on. Now, Another question was, can we map out these dimensions with more sof sophisticated tools like neuroimaging? And in our first studies, we compared psilocybin versus ketamine because we were interested whether can we replicate on a biological level the dimensions that Dietrich had described as oceanic boundlessness or anxious ego dissolution or the visual effects, is there any common denominator if you use different inducers? We were not so interested to look at the specific effects of uh, psilocybin or ketamine or amphetamines. We wanted first to show is there a kind of underlying neurobiology or a pattern of alterations in brain activity that may reflect the dimensions of these states. And in fact, what you see here the effect in, in ketamine, if you give ketamine and measure people in resting states, quite an overlap of activity in the frontal cortex compared to psilocybin. So without going into the details, this was uh, the first uh, uh, input we had in a, in a model we developed over these years, how can we more appropriately and more detailed tease out uh, the relationship between neuronal brain activation and psychological experiences. And the problem is that you can only ask subjects uh, what do they experience and then use this kind of scores we get through the rating scales and use a mathematical model to fit them back to the brain activity patterns. But we depend on the first perspective information we get from the volunteers. The pattern we get here cannot be interpreted really without uh, the subjective information of a subject. So just as an example, here you see red dots is the frontal cortex here and the occipital parietal cortex. If we have an increasing activation in these four regions on the left hemisphere of the brain and in addition, a reduction in the amygdala, which is responsible for fear reactions and modulation of uh, emotions, and also uh, an increase in hippocampal uh, areas, we found that this pattern with a few regions on the right hemisphere, uh, similar on this uh, locus here, then we found quite a nice correlation to this oceanic boundlessness. In contrast to this, we found more anxiety, uh, anxious and uh, kind of uh, anxious ego dissolution, also with loss of ego boundaries, but experienced sometimes a little bit uh, with a little bit of panic when there was a decrease in uh, very deep prefrontal areas and an increase in thalamic activity. 
And we think that the thalamus is particularly responsible for filtering and gating from external stimulus to the, to the brain. And if the filter breaks down, let's say, more than uh, normal, it regulates sensory input, then people can get panicked and uh, go into this more uh, anxious state. So we can also use other tracer techniques like uh, receptor labeling. We develop the 2A agonist, uh, sorry, antagonist that uh, sticks on the 2A receptors. It's F18 altanserin, and you can map where are the 2A receptors. We had a lot of evidence from animal research and from our uh, blocking uh, experiments where we blocked this receptor and we could almost or virtually block all the psychedelic effects. But then we want to know how is the receptor occupancy uh, with uh, psilocybin in this case uh, at this receptor site. And you see here, uh, without psilocybin, you have a certain uh, measure, a certain uh, binding uh, capacity in different brain areas, with our different brain areas. And if you give uh, psilocybin, then you reduce the binding. And these uh, are the differences. Here is a placebo, here is a with uh, psilocybin. And then you can make difference maps and map out the occupancy. Now, interestingly, the more people were in this oceanic boundlessness state, and we're happily and um, kind of uh, deeply uh, melt, have to had the feeling melting with the cosmos, the more frontal areas were occupied by psilocybin, it nicely correlated with the psychological effects, just the occupa uh, occupancy in this uh, prefrontal receptor sites. So let's go to visionary uh, effects, let's go a little bit into the neurobiology of visions and hallucinations here. What you see is typically, if it uh, moves, uh, what you would say it's an illusion. Now what our subjects report mostly about in a 70% is elementary hallucinatory phenomena like uh, patterns and spirals moving and uh, going around and about to 40% more complex uh, hallucinatory phenomena or or experiences, it might be people, objects, animals, and so on. Those are typically things people draw after we have uh, done our investigation. They have time to draw, to listen to music, and so on. So now, vision is not a simple thing. It's a complex construct. And here I try to explain it a little bit for non-scientists uh, in this uh, field. If you have sensory input through the eye, and it goes through the pathway from the retina to the primary occipital cortex, which is the primary uh, uh, visual field uh, where uh, information is processed, then there is another pathway going into all the limbic systems that are responsible for giving a balance, a value to the visual experience. It's uh, an older part of the brain. On the other hand, in the occipital cortex, you have different pathways, one going that way, one going this way. And all these neurons, they try to process the physical quality of the external input. And the qualities are, for instance, only neurons that measure contrasts, or they measure lines. But there are no neurons that measure, for instance, arrows or faces per se. These uh, are all these uh, physical uh, properties are decomposed, and the single neurons then measure feature. And if th you take these two pathways, they're much more, but they go just on this, then we have neurons that give you the information what do you see in the outer world and where do you see that. And all this information comes together in the frontal cortex has to be interpreted with the value system that adds the balance to the visual experience. So that's the so-called bottom-up from the external world into the brain information processing. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is that you constantly modulate the information that comes into the brain by frontal cortex, top-down modulation in these uh, areas that process the visual stimuli. 
So it's not just a simple mechanistic coming in of information, it's on the one hand there are mechanisms that gauge the stimulus, they may be related in deeper brain areas like the thalamus here. On the other hand, there are based on previous experience on um, what you expect to see and on um, other factors uh, how this information is uh, processed. So we think that somewhere in between bottom up and top down there is uh, the most important going on in terms of consciousness. So what we found is that uh, psychedelics modify only an interesting circumscribed area, neurons that are responsible for motion detection, they get some somehow weird, but there was nothing at the primary visual cortex, uh, neurons that measure contrast or other things. Then we found something that was very interesting, neurons that are responsible for face recognition. And these are the only neurons in the brain that uh, each neuron can detect a kind of gestalt. That means uh, if you think of a face, it has two eyes and a mouse, that's a gestalt, that's not just two dots on the, on the line, but we make out of this already a face with that simple information. That's a kind of object completion. And we thought with PET scanning, some years ago, these areas are modified, the areas that are responsible for motion detection, and we speculated, okay, the reduction uh, in, in some processing here may be really responsible for that we think the uh, things in the outer world move and uh, slowly go, for instance, the music and so on, that this uh, might be a first single uh, explanation how uh, illusions can be based on more neuroscience-based concepts. So, I don't need, we did an, uh, more imaging studies and could see that some of the areas that I explained uh, were modified that are uh, responsible for face uh, recognition. And then we wanted to test a little bit deeper using brain mapping methods how uh, psychedelic uh, of this, uh, this psilocybin in this case modify the information processing over time and then for that we used uh, EEG brain mapping where we can measure uh, the uh, state activity uh, over a second and we can shoot about 1000 pictures how about this constellation because uh, we measure with a frequency over uh, one kilohertz, that means about a thousand times per second. So what we did, because we thought that there must be something, uh, the brain may not really um, be able to make the object completion properly. We used a uh, classical paradigm called the Kinesa figures here, you see this triangle, this pacemaker here, but there are no lines here. You have the impression that must be a triangle and you complete that. That's a typical object completion or physically it's, it's an illusion. It's, a, it's nothing here. It's no contrast difference and we have known that the cells responsible for contrast, they work properly, but now we wanted to know what's going on if uh, we look at uh, such a simple uh, physical input uh, during uh, psilocybin. And we could measure that over time. That means if we have 124 electrodes over the scalp, we can measure the topography of the electrical distribution and can follow the processing of uh, this figure. Oops. So this is a typical response. We give a, you show such a figure uh, on a computer, subject is on the electrodes, first response, and it goes down. That's the response within about 300 millisec to showing of this Kinesa figure. Now you take a, a control figure, which is the just turning out, and you don't uh, have the illusionary triangle, and so the response is different. So we found this is the, the different response to the non-Kinesa figure, where you don't complete the object, 
and then we search for where is the generator of this different curve here. So, so you can find out based on a more mathematical uh, tricks where is uh, the processing. And here you see a slowed down reality, uh, real difference map uh, where this happens and in both brain areas here, this uh, occipital cortex. And this is not uh, a third of a second. It, it is, uh, comes from left to right, it goes up in the visual cortex, and then information con is controlled, the processing from the frontal cortex, having from the frontal cortex a back influence of this processing. So what were psychedelics doing? They interestingly reduce the reading out of information, particularly in the right hemisphere. We don't have a good explanation why it's more intense, uh, it's an a, a disbalance between left and right, it's also on the left side, but particularly on the right side. And at about 170 milliseconds after we have given the stimulus. And this, is, uh, this uh, reduction of processing is um, um, dose dependent. So we increase the dose, it's uh, more impairment. And then what we found, if we use more techniques where we look at the connectivity between frontal cortex and occipital cortex, we found that the influence of the top-down control is reduced, and the more the uh, connectivity breaks down, the more subject started to hallucinate. And that this may be starting up from a simple physical stimulus going up where the brain cannot really interpret the stimulus anymore and complete it, uh, you fill in and you construct your own uh, world. And uh, there's just a simple model how hallucinatory phenomena could uh, uh, be based on. So this is another interesting uh, concept. It's perceptual rivalry. You see the vase or the face, but you cannot see both things simultaneously uh, processed to, this, uh, to the similar extent. Or here, a neck cube where it turns in, turns out. You cannot control these things. At this uh, process, consciousness jumps in. It's completely made unconscious. You don't have uh, the possibility to modify the switching rates. There's another uh, interesting experiment you can do. You can use computer software and animate these dots, and they come and go, and you have the illusion that something is turning on, like a ball from going in one direction, and if you relax, then it sometimes goes in the other direction. And if we give everybody, if you a mouse to click, everybody has his completely independent uh, switching rates. May somebody may switch off to 1.5 sec, the other after 2 sec. One may have uh, only half a, a sec, and uh, each has his switching rate. And the switching rates are not stable; they are distributed. And that I can show you here. That's the distribution of the switching rate normally. This girl uh, switched uh, in seeing the switching of the ball every 1.5 sec, but sometimes with two sec, sometimes shorter, and that is what we call the individual distribution of the switching rate. So we were interested because psychedelic were said to directly change how the we may have access to subconscious uh, experiences and may, in a way, modify the access uh, to subconscious processing. So we just came up with a simple experiment. Uh, Olivia Carter from Australia came to our lab and has done this. And interestingly, if we give psilocybin and we wait for three hours, we found that the switching rates get extremely nicely tuned. So subject became in a very rhythmic oscillation. The brain was not, or the, the phenomenon, the switching was not uh, distributed anymore, and we thought the brain comes in a specific rhythm. This is interesting because this, uh, we cannot influence, influence that uh, just in a normal waking state, but this is the first indication that uh, in psychedelic state something is going on with the synchronization of brain areas across regions. So we work on this but I have no time to go into that with much more 
complex EEG measures where we can look uh, whether certain brain areas go into a coherent uh, phase lock uh, processing. So what is interesting, Olivia went down to India because uh, they had already studied some of people in meditation and what you see here, she could get a number of interested uh, uh, students from Dalai Lama and this their normal switching rate like our normals and here you have the psilocybin effect and the tune in and they left and said okay they were very very interested in the experiment let's do that without drugs and exactly they were capable to do that so that motivated us now to do both as we started the study that we uh, look, we're going to look whether psilocybin has an impact in people that have uh, long-term experience with uh, meditation and the other way around. Can we learn something from these uh, well-trained uh, monks? So now I want to go a little bit more in emotional effects of psychedelics. So we went on with uh, or trapped in because we did so much uh, research uh, into visual effects of psychedelics, which I could not go in today. But uh, one interesting uh, experiment uh, a student did was, he was interested, uh, based uh, similar like Matt Begot has said, uh, ecstasy or MDMA has some impact on emotional processing on psychedelics or at least uh, serotonergic agonists. They hit the 1A and 2A receptors do they also have an effect on emotion and how we process emotion? And nobody had looked at that over the years, so we started to look more closely in potentially positive effects. Because some of our volunteers over the years always said, uh, I, I feel what you say uh, when we uh, investigated them, they had the impression at least that they completely understand us, not we are normal thinking, but by feeling. But uh, we detect everything in a face and in a muscle tension without talking about it. It's mostly done subconsciously. And what you see here is a little uh, a part of uh, the face, and uh, we you can rate that fate. Is this guy uh, panicked or is it anger? And so on. You just have four possibility, and this is a typical. Uh, neuropsychological experiments. You give a subject 50, 60, 70, 80 such faces, all different, uh, have different valences, and they have to push problems. And uh, so we went into this experiment. It's called uh, the reading the mind in the eyes because you have to find out, you have to, via visual experience and your uh, processing of this constellation of the eyes, what might this person feel? You go into another perspective. It's not your perspective, but you try via, let's say, empathic uh, entering in that mind what could be in here. But most of the decision decisions you make is not really rational. So. We did other things. You can take words, positive and negative words, and neutral words, and people have to hit the bottom very fast, as fast as they can, to let's say to positive words and uh, or negative words. Depends how the paradigm is uh, designed, and you can measure reaction time. And then you put in a go no go, and s you say they should not push a button by certain balances, and uh, you can. In this case, you use more a cognitive emotional processing, while this is more a perceptual input of information. So what happened with uh, psilocybin? On the one hand, psilocybin increased mood based on different mood rating scales, and the same, it reduced the processing uh, of happy faces. People could much better read out what this subject could feel or how in what state he could be. It was very perplexing and it was very tightly linked to the 2A two two receptor stimulation. But when we block the 2A receptor, there are many serotonin receptors, then uh, we lose the effect 
we lose the effect on mode, that's the first perspective experience, we cannot measure that physically, but the subject report that in the scales, and this is the neuropsychological rating. So, based on this, we decided let's go and look a little bit, uh, can we go deeper into the emotional uh, processing on the psilocybin and ketamine, and we had known that since 10 years, some people go back to ketamine in psychotherapy, or at least in experimental psychotherapy, and here you see uh, an infusion with ketamine, a placebo versus ketamine in the depressed patient that were, was resistant to normal therapy. Here, the, they rated this mode over days, and you see the decline of the uh, depressed uh, symptoms was turned on very fast. It's a very fast onset of the uh, positive effect of ketamine. And Charlie Grubb showed similar with psilocybin, but not uh, within hours and days, but at least over months. This uh, was a little bit the basis. We thought, okay, let's a little more push a little more our energy into this uh, emotional processing with psychedelics, and we do it with ketamine. But we, we uh, emphasize now the, the serotonergic and psychedelics. Here can you can read also something different out of the curve. It goes slow, and this is an indication over time that a psychedelic may turn on uh, a plastic. Uh, plasticity in the brain that may turn on an effect. It would be nice to give the, do the dose, the psilocybin, several times and then study is there even uh, improvement over time because it's faster. That's uh, the goal of our studies. So I'll give you a little bit a concept about depression because nowadays if you want to go into de depression, do not just rate the symptoms. You can do it as in from a clinical approach. Uh, as a, a depressed patient has symptoms, sad mood, anhedonia, his fatigue, impaired concentration, worthlessness, and so on, suicidal ideations. That's the typical clinical ratings. But what we want to go in is we have more the question, can we uh, have better uh, markers of depression based on neurophysiology in combination with this uh, subjective rating and can we find predictors and possibly subgroup depressed patients over time and then look which of the depressed patients may particularly respond to psilocybin or ketamine. What is known, if you study depressed patients, and we have done a number of imaging studies in our institute, and e uh, EEG studies, and so on, and we found, and this is well known, it's not a finding from our lab, but it's internationally uh, known, it's a very nice review here, which I cite here, they have a kind of emotional bias, and the bias is that I depressed patients, they hang on the negative stimuli, if they are perceptive, if, uh, for instance, seeing faces, if there is cognitive uh, input, they process much more negative stimuli. They think about words. If you give them negative words, they, uh, this turns on a kind of scheme and cycle that they cannot go away. And even of the highest level in r uh, relation to self-reflexive uh, processes like self-esteem and so on, being worthless uh, on, on the level of self, and uh, assessing the self is much more complex than assessing uh, ba uh, basic emotional processing uh, based on perceptual input or on cognitive processes. This we understand quite good in normals, but uh, measuring self-related processing is much more complex. So what we found, and it has been described several times, that is the breast patient, they look with the eye always in the negative, in the direction of the negative stimuli, and you can measure this kind of activity with uh, neuroimaging. But we also know negative stimuli come into the brain, go to the thalamus, to the old amygdala, it gets activated, they get aroused, and frontal areas in the brain, like the subgenual anterior cingulum, is overactive. But what's most interesting for us these regions in the frontal cortex are not active enough and have no feedback on the incoming information. So, because we understand this quite good, we wanted to understand 
how is that, can that be used with psychedelics and depressed patients. So classical stimuli are these kind of phases where we have a lot of data. Now, here, depressed patients, as I said, are overactive in the anterior cingulum at this uh, area here. It's about here. And top-down information from these areas uh, is not that strong that they inhibit the amygdala, which is hooked up or is important for emotion regulation. What you see here is a typical uh, activation uh, FDG or water label PET uh, of psilocybin. They activate, psilocybin and ketamine activate particularly this area we are interested in. And uh, here is sometimes in depressed overactive and we had the hypothesis if we activate this region, the higher, uh, less active regions in depressed, we can reload or we kind of can reconfigure the top-down control over the limbic system through pushing the, the brain in the depressed patients and reactivate this uh, failure. So we use this kind of phases with all these emotions. We did the uh, experiment, first a uh, physical one, uh, what I have to say, which is important, we used first uh, that I wanted to skip, but I tell you now, we used a behavioral uh, experiment where we looked at the threshold. We presented the faces with very short presenting uh, presentation times of 10, 20, up to 170 millisec to find out whether depressed patients or normal subjects have an impairment in uh, detecting the face. If that would be the case, then we could not use the paradigm. And then we did the EEG measurements where we gave positive, negative, and neutral faces and wanted to find out how are they processed and how are they modified by psilocybin or ketamine. Here, we could not find an impact of psilocybin on the detection uh, in the subliminal uh, detection ti uh, presenting times 20 to 30 millisec, but there was a modification if we present uh, pictures longer for uh, fearful faces, but not for happy faces. And that was very striking that psilocybin has a specific effect of a particular valence. That means the happy faces go through without modification, the negative get modified. So it, why is that interesting? Because ketamine reduces both fearful faces here and happy faces. And this is subconsciously. If you give the pictures only for 10 millisec, you just see a flash, but it's not, it does not come in consciousness the information, but it is processed by the brain and it is uh, read out correctly. This word the negative, this uh, uh, we can measure by EEG, they react at the brain. What goes on when you see the picture, if we, give, uh, we show them a little bit longer, about uh, 100 to 200 millisec, consciousness uh, jumps in and enhances that processing here. Consciously, ketamine is more reduced to fearful. Psilocybin is uh, here to fearful, sorry, here to fearful for psilocybin, but psilocybin had no effect on the happy. That's what we saw in the behavioral task. But interestingly, consciousness is not here just for nothing, and we are not uh, very stupid automatons. Uh, we can do things automatic, but jumps, uh, consciousness helps to uh, improve this uh, processing. So, just here shown again, normal processing with uh, psilocybin and a reduction for the fearful, but no effect in the happy, in the subconscious con constellation, and here conscious. So that motivated us to say, okay, we have given ketamine to depressed patients, we have done the same experiments, and they really uh, could, uh, it was helpful. Now, the next uh, study, we were going to depressed, we have just designed the study and approval, but we have not tested yet uh, the effect in depressed patients. But what we have done, we have shown with more imaging data, is there really a top-down modulation upon the amygdala? And that's what we found. We found with psilocybin, the more 
these frontal areas gets activated at the right spot where we proposed, the Mordi amygdala gets down modulated. At least it's uh, quite a hope that uh, we have a biological measure to study things in depressed patients on a science-based side, and then we have the subjective uh, side, and we can't bring these things together. Now, I don't have too much time anymore. I just want to go back to this effect Charlie Grob saw that it is a slow process over time in, depre uh, in, in um, terminal cancer patients that anxiety goes down over months in, uh, after giving psilocybin. What we have known from animal data and what we partially replicate in we have an animal lab is it has been shown with LSD that LSD increases in this frontal cortex where we see this activation increases glutamate and glutamate is the strongest or is the excitatory transmitter that activates these pyramidal cells in layer 5 and George Akhajanin at Yale has shown that LSD really activates by single cell recording these cells and you can block this effect with blockers and use specific uh, serotonin 2A antagonist, uh, MDL, and you see it, you have no glutamate release. As you give LSD and after minutes, that's always 15 minutes, you have marked increase in this excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Why is that so impressive? Not because these animals now start to do s strange things, but because neuro um, increasing glutamate is a mediating factor for activating uh, neuroplasticity via uh, throughput, for instance, through AMPA receptors. That is studied on a molecular basis already with ketamine, with psilocybin. We don't know that much. We know that psilocybin increases uh, BDNF, and most uh, recently, last week, there was a paper coming out that showed the first time that uh, psilocybin increases via BDNF spines in the hippocampus, which is profound uh, important for learning. So we know in depressed patients, a colleague in our department has shown that depressed patients have not enough glutamate at directly at that spot that we are so interested in. And we hope that uh, psilocybin can measure that's on the program Psilocybin increases glutamate and may lead to neuroplastic effect, which we have to measure on the long run. So the idea is uh, you give uh, ketamine or psilocybin, we now study mostly psilocybin. Psilocybin activates uh, certain cells that leads to an increase in glutamate, and increase in glutamate turns on neuroplastic factors within the cell, and on the long run, you uh, reload your brain, you fr uh, brush up, and you have, uh, for instance, better learning or faster fear extinction. And this is the other good news. Uh, two papers have shown so far in animals that psilocybin reduces uh, or facilitates extinction of fear memory. And uh, that uh, goes absolutely in this direction that uh, is uh, linked in a way to learning and neuroplasticity. So I have to thank a lot of my students. Uh, we have a very good platform. We have uh, a core team and we are happy that I can say we have about 12 subjects that work only on psychedelics, uh, three postdocs and three, four uh, thesis candidates and a number of uh, master students. And I wish to thank uh, the Hefter and Neurometrics is a foundation I had uh, founded uh, four years ago to support the whole activity and it's an independent uh, institute. We have uh, often students from the US come for a thesis or master students for from Australia and I would like to thank Rick Dublin for making that all happening to see you here. Thank you very much. Five or six, seven minutes. Questions for Franz, please. I'm sorry. Uh, it was Could 
Oh, the conclusion, I can tell you. <laughs> and if you have uh, a question? This, uh, this was um, because so many institutes, just in, in the US, uh, National Institute of Mental Health, they started to use much more and more this ketamine approach uh, in depressed patients. It was more that uh, the experiment we do with uh, phase processing indicate that ketamine, um, psilocybin modify emotional processing that because ketamine blocks the NMDA receptor, the, the glutamate system via NMDA is involved, the serotonin system via serotonin 2A receptors, but that they differently modulate this emotion processing. The ketamine blocks k negative and positive phases, which is a little bit opposite to the uh, psilocybin effect that only blocks the fearful phases. But this is just a model to go deeper into how these drugs may modulate emotion, but we are not so interested in the acute effects as said, we are interested in the long-term effects. As we have to look now for neuroplastic factors. You can measure this, if for instance, through uh, spectroscopy and connectivity on the long run. You have to measure patient several time, and you can possibly look at BDNF in, in the plasma, but it we're not sure whether it's really linked up to the BDNF release in the brain. Yes, any other question? Matt. <laughs> Thank you for the really wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering to what extent you're concerned about uh, sort of low level effects from illusory motion or pupil size changes like partly driving the EEG and uh, other perceptual findings you get, that if people are seeing illusory motion, it's harder to form a kinesa triangle because the angles just aren't consistent anymore. And you know, how do we control for that doing research? So I couldn't understand the last, how we get rid of that? Yeah, could yeah could exactly. Rid of that. How, how yeah. can we control for it? Yeah, we, we use an eye track. <laughs> So we, we follow the pupils, uh, but uh, Michael has uh, analyzed the single, the single sweeps and has looked uh, a little more closely into that. But I think it's not a confounder, really. But even it is, uh, we are more interested <laughs> in the pre-stimulus activity. We, we found that the activity before you give uh, the stimulus is determining how you react how big the response is. That's, that's much more interesting and uh, that explains a little bit the people are, in diff are on diff different level and you take, uh, or yourself, today uh, you are on that level, tomorrow on another, each time when you take these kind of drugs, something different happens. So it's more toward the prediction. Uh, th that's something very uh, interesting if you, you like that's it. Super cool, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the fabulous use of hard sciences to look at a lot of soft emotional behavior related things. So congratulations and excellent work there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the question? Okay, and the question is, um, have you or anybody else looked at uh, different brain states and changes in the brain during spontaneous healing, spontaneous remission, or after spontaneous healing and spontaneous remission? Based just, uh, just no, not yet. That's a, that's very interesting. Yes, no, we haven't done that. Do you know anybody that might might have? Yeah, we have to design it. We have capacities. Let's always do a little bit uh, things. We are curious. We, we are not so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, close. I would say narrow-minded. We can we can do things. Yes. <laughs> When I understand, you improve the uh, control of the cortex over the amygdala. Um, and I always tell my patients that the limbic system is stronger, that you cannot think emotions away. You cannot change with thinking emotions because the amygdala is responsible for your survival. So you will win. Uh, Am I explaining it wrong, or can you combine this story with your... Yeah. I can't show it uh, here now, but uh, what we have uh, investigated and others also, we, if you train depressed patients just on psychotherapy, they can learn to reactivate frontal regions. We use a neurofeedback system, hook up electrodes, 
their own, they, they have to learn their own rhythms and always if they can relax or activate this, this area, it's a tricky thing to do, they get a feedback via their own EEG and they see a little film and so they have to concentrate. So what I want to make the point is you can learn via training to activate your frontal cortex and you can use pharmacos or psilocybin, you can use both and interestingly in depressed patients uh, it helps, uh, it reduces uh, amygdalar activity. We can, we can show that via imaging, so I believe in it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, for, for someone who wants to increase their neuroplasticity, say, would you, uh, do you have any idea whether it would be better to take frequent small doses or infrequent large doses of psilocybin? It's much too early to say uh, how we would do that. Uh, we have animal data that show it depends dramatically when you give psilocybin, when you give it immediately after learning or during the information uptake, you can do the opposite. You can increase uh, in encoding uh, of information and also of storage. Uh, that means you can uh, make an imprint of, for instance, fearful faces of what stimuli you take. So uh, this is not, is not yet clear, but at least what we see is uh, that certain factors get turned on and, and uh, how we can influence this all, I don't know, but uh, we know much more with ketamine where we see that mTOR is, if, if you understand this process, is you turn on AMPA receptors, you increase intracellularly mTOR, but we don't know whether psilocybin goes the same direction. Thanks. Thank you. Yes.